Hey everybody, welcome back to Bob Key TV time once again for the broom wagon. Up this week on the broom wagon, plenty, <laughs> plenty of musette musings, no races to report on, but Peter Sagan uh, in a friendly competition. Uh, of course, the jersey of the week for 2017, which is right around the corner just a couple of days from now. And of course, the tweet of the week. All of that coming up on the broom wagon. Okay, let's get into the jersey this week. We're going to look at Bahrain Merida. Let's see, uh, the Bahrain Merida squad, led by Vincenzo Nibali. Um, pretty handsome jersey. Very nice. Red torso. Gray, dark, dark, dark blue. <laughs> Grayish blue sleeves. And... Of course, the ubiquitous little green stripe on the deep blue shorts, it looks like. Very handsome jersey, made by Sportful, uh, which, uh, if I'm not mistaken, have, have been doing the clothing for the Tinkoff squad for the last couple of years. Uh, an Italian company, and uh, very very good, <laughs> high quality uh, cycling apparel. I have some leg and arm warmers from Sportful somewhere in my collection that I've had for many, many years. So uh, I'm thinking I might have had those. <laughs> They're getting a little threadbare, but it's been probably 20 years since I got those. And it might be time for some new arm warmers and leg warmers. Uh, and so we shall see, but very handsome, very distinct. Should be pretty easy to pick them out in the Peloton next year. Bahrain Merida looking strong. All right, Peter Sagan, a uh, little holiday season fun and adventure on the ice <laughs> and don't oftentimes equate cyclists with ice skating ice skating uh, and hockey not a 100 percent crossover sport but peter sagan as you can see in this video uh is all in <laughs> uh all in with the shot on goal uh and if you're his team manager <laughs> And you see him crash into the ice like that. That is not what you want to see from your marquee player. <laughs> uh, but as usual, Sagan bounces back up like he's made out of concrete and rebar. And pretty good skater. Pretty good shot on goal. Um, I, I, I have the feeling that if Peter Sagan, and correct me if I'm wrong, I have the feeling from this video, if Peter Sagan wanted to be a hockey player, uh, it would not be very long before he was one of the best. And you can imagine him translating his balance and his cycling skills to the ice could be a force to reckon with, even in hockey, which I don't know how many professional cyclists you can say that about. <laughs> Maybe none. Uh, in the Netherlands and across Scandinavia, a strong uh, speed skating, tradition, so I'm sure there's been some crossover over the years between speed skaters and cyclists, most notably, of course, Eric Haydn, uh, five gold medals in the 1980 Olympics, and then a pretty distinguished career with the 7-Eleven cycling team, including uh, the points jersey for the in-race competition in the Giro d'Italia in 1985, and started the Tour de France in 1986, so uh, <laughs> Eric Haydn also a very versatile athlete and a spectacular speed skater and great cyclist in his day. All right, everybody, next up, the Musette Musings. All right, up in the Musette Musings, well, the Team Sky controversy surrounding Bradley Wiggins and what exactly was delivered to him at the 2011 Dauphiné from an official of British Cycling, Simon Cope, uh, David Brilsford's, um testimony in front of British Parliament that it was Flumicil, an over-the-counter decongestant available in France, not available without a prescription though in um, the UK. So <laughs> uh, apparently they have found Brailford's 
um, explanation woefully inadequate, and he will be asked to testify again in the future as they try to get to the bottom of this and clear it up. Um, I asked last week, if you recall, how many people believed that that Dave Brailsford was telling the truth, and <laughs> I couldn't find one single person that thought Brailsford was telling the truth that responded to my request for that. So <laughs> you can uh, rest easy that British Parliament has agreed with you, and at least thus far, uh, do not feel that Brailsford is telling the truth either. <laughs> Uh, in the meantime, uh, also a drugs raid and a visit to the Manchester headquarters of Cycling UK was um, uh, undergone by investigators and this is an investigation that continues to move forward. Um, no no um, report thus far on what kind of sanctions might be forthcoming and so a pretty sticky wicket for Dave Brailsford, Team Sky, and British Cycling all unfolding here during the holidays. Um, and I'm sure that will continue to plague Team Sky in the weeks and months to come. And we'll just see how that plays out during the race season. But it's definitely not um, the ideal way to rest and recuperate in the off season to have this controversy hanging over you. And for Dave Brailsford, uh, last week I recommended that he step down and nothing has come to light in the meantime that would change my opinion of, uh, of him doing that. Just for the benefit of the team, the team moving forward, the sponsorship, and to restore the credibility that cycling has been looking for for many years. I don't have to go over all of the reasons for that, um, but Dave Brailsford's, um, his explanation still, in my opinion, as to the circumstances and the contents of the Ziploc baggie are completely inaccurate and it makes me wonder what else he might be hiding. They are the team that has championed their transparency, uh, their zero tolerance, and Dave Brailsford has most certainly not applied himself to those same ideals that the team aspires to. The only way to make that um, uh, more of a possibility in the future is if Dave Brailsford sits down. So unless he's willing to do that, I don't see the team being able to market itself as a zero tolerance team or the team with the maximum amount of transparency. And time will tell in the near future and uh, hopefully the investigators don't let this drag on too long and that they have some concrete and uh, significant um, penalties involved for the people that have perpetrated this on the sport of cycling with, without, uh, without, with, without an, any kind of logical and rational explanation. So if you go back to last week's video, you can see uh, a lot of the questions that I have, have had about this. And I can assure you, <laughs> those and more continue to open up. And those from last week have not been answered uh, whatsoever. So Dave Brailsford, we'll see what happens, but um, like I said, it would be a surprise to me if he was allowed to uh, carry on for very much longer in his current position as um, uh, the principal team manager of Team Scott. Time will tell. Uh, and in the wake of all of this, uh, Bradley Wiggins has announced his final, final retirement. He's come and gone a few times recently. He did say he would race again in 2017, but that seems to be out of the question at this point. So the definitive retirement of Bradley Wiggins uh, has just been announced also. So Bradley Wiggins had a great career. It's been uh, besmirched and tainted by these latest uh, revelations from his very powerful steroid injections before the 2012 Tour de France. And the 2011 Tour, and I believe the 2013 Giro d'Italia. So the Grand Tours that Bradley Wiggins raced exceptionally well at, time will tell whether or not um, the product he used was um, a PED or was medicine that provided him with a level playing field with the other athletes. 
<laughs> allergies and asthma being treated with that particular substance. Um, I think that the jury is still out on whether or not that's cheating with drugs or if that is indeed, as Bradley Wiggins contends, leveling the playing field so he can compete at the highest level in spite of uh, asthma and debilitating allergies. Um, I, I, I do believe that athletes with legitimate asthma, childhood asthma, uh, that they've had their whole lives should not be handicapped um, racing at the highest level. They should not have a built-in handicap that prevents them from achieving the maximum they're capable of. Uh, whether that means this particular drug, I'm not sure, um, but Bradley Wiggins will um, can paint his face blue <laughs> and carry on. It doesn't seem as if his legacy uh, will be the same as it was uh, just a few weeks ago when all of this came out. Um, but at this point, cycling officials, Tour de France, haven't made any announcement about taking away his yellow jersey. So it seems as if the 2012 Tour de France results will stand for now. Uh, moving forward, Nairo Quintana had an interesting quote recently. He is planning, or at least he was planning until his team manager heard about his plans, <laughs> of doubling up the Giro and the Tour, doing the Giro and the Tour de France in the same season. Uh, his idea was he would not go to the Giro with the idea of winning but merely as a way to prepare the Tour de France. And I think he's doing that, or he's announcing that he'd like to do that, uh, in spite of uh, his team manager saying that is not 100% guaranteed. I think that Nairo's Tour de France was not what he had hoped it would be. He did finish on the podium, uh, but plagued by, I think, a lack of race miles. And he had a very light couple of months of racing before the Tour de France in 2016. And uh, after the tour, he was absolutely flying in the Vuelta. And so Quintana, not great in the tour, but spectacular in the Vuelta with the win in that Grand Tour. Um, so I think maybe he feels like if he does the Giro at uh, three-quarter speed or 90% or 95% or 99% speed and not go for the win, that will get him more ready for the Tour de France. I don't think that two Grand Tours in the same season uh, is a good idea um, if you don't have a spectacular Giro or Tour that you hope for, you can f salvage something out of your season by having a good Vuelta. Uh, but you shouldn't plan your season on that. You should plan your season around focusing on trying to win, if you're a Grand Tour contender, on one Grand Tour and not doing one for training and hoping it prepares you for the other. I think that Nairo should follow a more traditional racing schedule that would include a Tour of Romandy and either the Dauphiné or the Tour de Suisse, Tour de Suisse before the Tour de France in the years to come. Um, and so we'll see if Nairo is allowed to do the Giro um, three-quarter speed or at training speed which for Nairo Quintana is still, <laughs> could be close to winning, actually. <laughs> um, but I believe it's better for not just Nairo, but any GC uh, contender to focus on the tour um, and do the racing program that Chris Froome has followed in the last few years, and which he, by the way, has announced he is going to follow again in 2017, almost to the letter of what he did last year. So race in Australia, in February, early February, and then Catalonia in the springtime, and then the Dauphiné, or excuse me, then Tour of Romandy, and then the Dauphiné, and then the Tour de France. And that's been a very successful uh, format for Chris Froome. And uh, if the, nothing catastrophic happens during any of those races, I think Chris Froome should be the uh, hands-on favorite uh, for the Tour de France to uh, repeat and get another victory in the Tour de France for Chris Froome. He's queued up for number four, and uh, that would be pretty impressive for Chris Froome. Team Skies won four out of the last five tours, uh, and that would be uh, five out of the last six Tour de France's if uh, Chris Froome does indeed win. Uh, that's a spectacular accomplishment, 
and um, uh, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how history views that. Um, but Quintana and Chris Froome should square off against each other, and I hope that Nairo Quintana is at his very best at the Tour de France. And um, it's a bit of a gamble to do the Giro first, and I would recommend not doing that. I don't think that's the best way to get ready for the Tour anymore. The Giro is just way too hard, way too competitive, and very dynamic, aggressive racing on small roads for the whole three weeks. And this year, incredibly challenging Giro race route and a very impressive field of top GC riders, including Fabio Aru, Vincenzo Nibali, Stefan Kreuzweg, Esteban Chavez, who don't feel they might be able to beat Chris Froome in this year's Tour de France. And so they're putting all of their energy in peaking on the Giro d'Italia, and that would be tough for Nairo to do both of those races. So uh, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Movistar team management has announced that that's not necessarily true, that Nairo might want to do that, but that might not be what happens. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, one last item for the Musette Musings. The Funvic Soul Cycles team from Brazil has been given a license to race at the pro continental level in 2017 following a 55 day suspension um, that expires in mid-February. Uh, if we cast our minds back a few weeks, three different riders on the team um, were found to be positive for CERA, C-E-R-A, a form of EPO. Um, and the UCI did do, um, I think, the right thing in suspending the team. Um, uh, 55 days is woefully inadequate, though. That's not nearly enough. And uh, starting in mid-February, they can just race again, uh, especially 55 days in the off-season. It has no meaning. <laughs> Uh, they will miss one team, the Tour of San Luis, uh, one race, excuse me, uh, one big race for, for UCI teams in the Americas, um, but 55 days uh, when the team should have a one-year suspension, in my opinion, and the management should be cleared out. This is uh, obvious signs of a systematic doping program where three different riders in the same very small window of time are all positive uh, for a form of EPO, and uh, those riders are suspended. But I think that if the UCI is truly serious about restoring the credibility of the, of the sport of cycling, um, and that's what Brian Cookson promised when he became president, when he was voted in to becoming president, um, they need to do more uh, when teams are obviously in mass cheating with drugs. And that's one of the scourges of the sport that we, we are in desperate need of eliminating. Um, teams like Fistina, going back to 1998, when uh, the team, the whole team was suspended from, uh, from the Tour de France in 1998 because uh, uh, the team Soigneur was found to have enough <laughs> performance enhancing drugs for uh, um, I guess for one Tour de France, but it seemed like a remarkable amount. And I mean, the the the, the examples of teams uh, systematically cheating with drugs are uh, are are legion. So we don't have to get into all of that right now. But I think the UCI did not do nearly enough to punish the Funvic Soul Cycle Squad uh, and the team manager. Um, no sanctions announced against him. Um, he, in a press release announcing this, uh, Benedito Azevedo, said nothing <laughs> about three of his riders being positive for drugs and just said that he's looking forward to 2017. Why is he still working uh, in cycling? Why has he not been suspended at least for a lot longer than 55 days and something that has real meaning as a deterrent. <laughs> if there's no significant penalties, you do not offer any deterrent whatsoever to cheating with drugs. You have to make that gamble 
so unsavory that people turn away en masse and do not take the temptation to do that. And Brian Cookson, in my estimation, has been a miserable failure in the fight against doping thus far in his presidency. I would love to get a comment from Brian Cookson about it. <laughs> and uh, if he does see these videos, I'm sure he can divine the theme and respond at his leisure accordingly. All right, everybody. <laughs> Next up, uh, the tweet of the week. All right, everybody, tweet of the week coming to us from Andre Greipel. Uh, wishing everybody a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Uh, serious winter training here in the squat rack. When you are squatting in the winter time, uh, you get to enjoy some chocolate. <laughs> and a happy new year to everyone. And uh, I um, would like to wish everybody a happy new year and a great 2017. Um, 2016 was an excellent racing year. Uh, a lot of great races throughout the season. And I have a feeling 2017 is going to be equally spectacular. And we are in for a thrilling season. Great teams, tremendous racers, and spectacular races. The tour is going to be great. The classics, the Giro, the Vuelta. Uh, it's shaping up to be an absolutely fantastic uh, 2017. Going to try to keep everybody uh, up to speed with all the news, all the rumors, all the gossip, all the scuttlebutt. And... A lot of riders changing teams, and that is going to continue to reveal itself throughout the early season and into the Grand Tours. Thanks a lot for watching all these videos, everybody. Um, I will really appreciate the comments. Uh, I want to thank you all for the subscriptions. Uh, keep them coming <laughs> so I can keep doing these. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you feel like it, and uh, follow me on Facebook and Twitter. And Happy New Year, everybody.